On October 7, 2002, Space Shuttle Atlantis lifted off from Launch Pad 39B of the Kennedy Space Center through mostly clear blue skies, carrying STS-112. There were no problems reported with the countdown, and the ascent performed to the standard timeline. For the first time in Space Shuttle history, a rocket cam video camera mounted to the upper part of Atlantis' external tank returned live video of the flight to NASA flight controllers. Two, one, we have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, building the station and our future in space. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Roger roll, Atlantic. Atlantis into the roll, the external tank camera, placing the shuttle in a heads down wing with wings level position for that eight and a half minute ride to orbit. The Florida Space Coast disappearing as uh, Atlantis moves into the correct azimuth for orbit. Arguably the most significant event from the launch was the ET bipod ramp shedding a chunk of foam estimated to be about 4 by 5 by 12 feet that broke away and hit the lower left SRB ET attach ring near the integrated electronic assembly box, causing a dent about 4 feet wide and 3 feet deep into the solid metal. Prior to the approval for the next mission, the situation was analyzed and NASA decided to press ahead under the justification that, quote, the ET is safe to fly with no new concerns. This faithful decision set the stage for tragedy just two launches later. Dave Wolf and Russian cosmonaut Fyodor Yurchikin seated down on the mid deck. One minute, 20 seconds into the flight. This view from long-range trackers at Playa Linda Beach, north of the Kennedy Space Center, and now the external tank camera view once again. Atlantis 11 and a half miles downrange, 17 miles in altitude, traveling 2,800 miles per hour. One minute, 45 seconds into the flight, about 20 seconds prior to solid rocket booster separation. Booster officer reports a good solid rocket booster separation. Guidance now converging. Atlantis is on board computers commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming the shuttle for a precise target in space for main engine cutoff. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, Space Shuttle Atlantis approached and docked with the space station to begin a week of joint operations for the STS-112 and Expedition 5 crews on October 9, 2002. Almost immediately, we begin the rendezvous process, which takes about two days of, of uh, burns to approach the space station. Uh, I'm up there in the front, along with my core rendezvous team, Dave Wolf, who's a former ice cream salesman. Uh, Pierce Sellers, the snail farmer, and Pam Melroy, who we call Tank Girl. Imagine how that would feel. We're all on the flight deck here. We all have a lot to do. It's very crowded. We're looking out two tiny windows as we travel along at 17,500 miles an hour, both vehicles traveling that speed. This picture is about 45 minutes before docking. Uh, you can see that we're closing very, very slowly to the space station. It's magnificent as you move in and look out those windows and look at the International Space Station hanging uh, above Earth's atmosphere. It's brilliant. The color is very metallic and looks almost like molten metal. It's so bright in the, uh, in the bright rays of the sun. As we move in, things gradually get more and more uh, exciting until we finally reach the space station, feel the thunk, and we dock. We know we've made it a very critical event uh, accomplished safely. With Commander Jeffrey Ashby at the controls, Atlantis' docking system engaged the pressurized mating adapter 2 as the two spacecraft sailed 245 miles above Central Asia at 5 miles per second. Crew members of Atlantis were the first visitors for Expedition 5 station crew 
who had arrived at the outpost the first week of June in 2002. The crew had been up there about four months when we opened this hatch and uh, talking to other crews they say that the most important thing for them is seeing new faces and uh, the second most important thing is food and the salsa we brought in a pecan pie and the third thing is mail. The S-1 truss segment which provides structural support for the space station radiators was the main payload of STS-112. The Boeing company along with Lockheed Martin started manufacturing the truss in May 1998 at Makud. The work was completed in March 1999. On flight day four, astronauts Weiston and Magnus used the station's Canadarm2 robotic arm to grapple the S-1 structure and remove it from Atlantis' payload bay and move it to the starboard end of the S-0 section. Four remotely operated motorized bolts locked the two truss segments together at 8.36 Central Daylight Time. Meanwhile, back in the airlock, the EVA team are imprisoned still on their uh, masks. When the pressure's down, we squirm into our spacesuits and uh, Pam and Fyodor put the final touches. You can see being gentle with us there. And there comes a moment to put on the helmets, and there's a final clunk, which is, means helmet on for the next 10 hours. We're sealed in there good. Fyodor and Pam check out the lights, all the extra equipment, one last look over everything. And then it's time to cram us into the airlock. But before that, we always indulge in a few pagan rites to appease the EVA gods. <laughs> These little ceremonies are very, very important to ensure mission success, if you do them right. Shove one guy in face first, so that he's facing the hatch put in all the luggage, shove the other guy in feet first, and there's just enough room to basically not scratch your nose because you can't. Close the hatch, and then it's another hour, and then you're ready to go out. Now this is an exciting moment. Opening the hatch, it's a 240 mile drop, so don't let go. Squirm out, look around, grab a handrail, and then get to work. As Wolf worked to accomplish to connect power, data, and fluid lines between the SO and S1 trusses, Sellers, on his first spacewalk, released the locks on three folded up radiators mounted on the S1, allowing S1's radiators to be oriented for optimal cooling. The spacewalking astronauts worked for seven hours and one minute outside the space station, 31 minutes longer than expected due to a problem with the Canadarm2. The glitch forced Wolf to complete installation of a television camera system on the far end of the truss without the assistance of the robot arm. Throughout the spacewalk, astronaut Melroy offered guidance and advice to the spacewalkers and kept them on schedule. Shuttle Commander Jeff Asby operated the shuttle's robotic arm, providing camera views for documentation. We ride the arm that, that Sandy is driving much of the time to do the detailed work. And if you happen to look, dare to look down, which I tried to avoid, tried to mainly focus on the station, you could get these incredible views, which if you let yourself, you can get kind of lost in. There's the empty payload bay. It used to have the truss inside, the laboratory module, the airlock that we have just come out of and we'll go back into after eight or nine hours total time, seven hours outside. There's the truss that has been installed. We have many tools and bags of equipment to keep organized and they're all on separate tethers and it can be a challenge keeping that straight. This is an antenna that we installed and you'll see how quickly it goes from day to night at the same time going from plus 200 degrees to minus 200 degrees. It takes a little temperature adjustment. Following a tool inventory check and cleanup activities, Wolf and Sellers re-endured Quest. Well, let's take you on a little tour of the station as it is right now. That's a picture of Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space. This is the service module. Sergey is showing us his bedroom. Uh, that's actually his bedroom, that little closet area there. You see pictures of his family. You can see his personal gear. And that white bag against the wall is his sleeping bag. That's where he spends the night. The service module is a very homey place, as, as Dave said. You saw the pictures on the wall. It's got kind of green carpeting everywhere. It's sort of cozy and warm and a little bit dark. It, uh, it feels like going to visit somebody's house. 
And this is the part of the house that you wouldn't ordinarily see. I think everybody has a place like this in their house. This is the closet of the space station. And you can see it's piled high with uh, boxes. Most of that is actually food. As we get towards the end of the closet area, this is the FGB module. You'll actually see some towels on the wall. That's where the station crew does their uh, daily sponge bath. And now as we go into the American segment of the space station, you can see that it feels very different than the Russian segment. It's very bright and airy, kind of metallic. It looks a lot more like an office space. And we'll take a quick peek here into the airlock, which is what you've seen a lot of earlier. That's where the spacewalks were conducted out of. And now we're gonna float along a little bit further into what I think of as the crown jewel of the U.S. segment. This is the U.S. laboratory, very aptly named Destiny, because the destiny of the space station is to do science in space. And the walls are crammed with experiments. Peggy is actually doing a little bit of sto stowage here for some of the things that we brought over for her. But uh, this uh, laboratory is a magic place to do science, and it's a wonderful place to be in the station that has both a place to live and a place to work. Now we're going to take a crazy little jink and go over here into the space shuttle. And here we are on the mid-deck of the space shuttle, which uh, is a combination kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, and living room for us. Jeff is making some dinner while Sandy is looking at her checklist to make sure we haven't left anything that we shouldn't have aboard the space station. Fyodor's taking a little coffee break there after having helped Sandy move some of these big bags back and forth between the shuttle and the station. And now we'll go up into the kind of the office area, the business end of the shuttle. It's upstairs. Uh, we call it the flight deck. You can see Piers here. He's working on the network. One of the first things we did when we got on orbit is actually set up a whole computer network up there to help support the things that we do. I'm also at the computer now, getting ready for undocking. And uh, just take a quick look around here. You can see how different the shuttle flight deck looks from the business end of the station. We have thousands of switches here. It looks a lot more like an airplane, and that is because it does because have to become an airplane on entry. After a week on board, the two crews said their last goodbye and closed the hatch between PMA-2 and Atlantis on October 16, 2002. The shuttle then slowly undocked from the station and performed the standard fly-around maneuver before making final separation from the station. As Peggy uh, performs what has become a tradition, there's a ship's bell aboard the station and she rang us off uh, in keeping with an old naval tradition. We uh, used the thrusters of the shuttle to actually push ourselves away from the station. This looks probably a whole lot like the docking did. We all had different responsibilities during the undocking. We're all operating various pieces of equipment. but. What we really wanted to do was all cram into the windows and look at the magical sight. It's, very, it's a very emotional time to see the S-1 truss and to fly around the station in a big arc, uh, which is what we do. We could look at the station from all different angles. The reason why we do that is to take pictures. We're documenting the station as it exists in this configuration, both for future crews and also for maintenance. But this is a, a tremendous feeling to look at the S-1 truss and think about the station as it will become in the future, as it's shown here, how much bigger it's going to get. And we're very proud of our small part in creating this huge international laboratory in space. It was, it's a very, very uh, wonderful feeling to back away and know that you've been a part of that. And also very rewarding to see an empty payload bay of your shuttle. After the shuttle's left station, there's about a day and a half of uh, going around in Earth orbit and getting ready to come home, looking at some excellent wine country in Italy. There's Suez again. Beautiful views. Two days later, Atlantis performed its deorbit burn and returned to runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center. And then we start working on converting the shuttle from being an orbiting a spacecraft into a very heavy high-tech glider. Get all the gear together, put the seats in place, put some systems asleep, get into our uh, pressure suits, and get ready for the entry itself. Well, we're whipping around the Earth at about 25 times the speed of sound. And so in order to slow down, we do a small um, 
burn over Australia and we come crashing into the atmosphere over Hawaii using the belly of the orbiter to aerodynamically break us. We come up across Central America doing about 14 times the speed of sound over the Gulf of Mexico and then up over the panhandle of Florida. Uh, Pam and I and Sandy are using the instruments to monitor our progress and about 50,000 feet, about four minutes before landing, um, I took over control of Atlantis for the landing. Uh, I passed it over to Pam for about 30 seconds of practice and then uh, took it back. This is the view out of um, Pam's uh, gun sight or heads up display. We made the turn to line ourselves up with the runway at uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and we came down about traveling about 350 miles an hour. As we round out and pull out of our dive, Pam lowered the landing gear and we lined up on the, on the center line and flared Atlantis out for a landing. Now remember, there's no power here. This is our only chance to land, so we've got to do it right the first time. As we roll out in the beautiful Florida sun, all I could think about was get this thing on center line for the final pictures. <laughs> I almost forgot to put on the brakes. You can see we came pretty close there. <laughs>